Welcome to the forum, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The forum is a collaboration between the Harvard Chan School and independent news media. Each program features a panel of experts addressing some of today's most pressing public health issues. The forum is one way the school advances the frontiers of public health and makes scientific insights accessible to policymakers and the public. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hi, my name is Paul Demko. I am the cannabis editor at Politico. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for everyone uh, in the room for braving the elements today. We have a uh, wonderful panel today to talk about CBD and marijuana. I'm gonna introduce everyone very quickly here. We have to my right, Bob Blendon, who's a professor of health policy and political analysis at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. We have Stacy Gruber, who is the director of the Marijuana Investigations for Nora Scientific Discovery Program at McLean Hospital and associate professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. We have Andrew Friedman, co-founder and partner at Friedman and Kosky Consulting Firm and uh, former director of the Marijuana Coordination for the state of Colorado. And finally, joining us remotely, we have David Grilotti, medical director of the Center for Medic Medicinal Cannabis Research at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Um, this v event is being presented jointly with Politico. Um, we are streaming live on the web, um, website of the forum, as well as Politico. And uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. So if you do have um, questions that you want to email, the uh, email address is theforum at hsph.harvard.edu. Again, that's theforum at hsph. Uh, .harvard.edu. Um, so to set the table a little bit about uh, marijuana and CD CBD, um, I think it's fair to say we're, we're living in some very interesting times in terms of uh, uh, rapidly changing policy landscape around the country. Um, we now have 33 states um, that have legal either medicinal or recreational markets, and it's literally changing every day. I mean, right here in Massachusetts, you can walk down the street, I think about a mile from here, and visit a dispensary and purchase marijuana. Um, just on Sunday, um, we saw the first recreational or adult use sales in, in Michigan begin. Um, so this is really, um, an interesting, an interesting time. And on the CBD side, um, we had in 2018, Congress pass a farm bill that legalized hemp. And what we've seen in the last year is just this massive um, growth in CBD, hemp-derived CBD products, um, in lotions, in tinctures, in foods, in beverages, that uh, you know, is just exploding in popularity and people are taking it for everything from insomnia to treating cancer. Um, and at the same time, you have the Food and Drug Administration really struggling and wrestling with how to regulate uh, all these new products that people are taking. Um, so that's just, Fascinating, just last week, the FDA sent out 15 warning letters to companies um, for making medical claims that, uh, you know, <laughs> that they shouldn't be making, I guess, is the easy way to put it. So it's a really interesting time. And uh, to give us a little more background, we're going to watch a, a clip from the, uh, from the Mayo Clinic uh, news network about uh, CBD. CBD comes from cannabis sativa which is the plant from which we get marijuana, which has THC, which is the effect that gets people high. CBD is being touted to help treat nausea, anxiety, cancer, arthritis, and even Alzheimer's. Does it work? We know in animal studies and some test tube studies, it seems to be pretty good uh, for anti-inflammatory, may have some anti-pain, 
uh, and it certainly has some effect on mood. Patients, such as those being treated with cancer, should talk with their care team before using CBD. It can interfere with the metabolism of certain chemotherapy agents. Dr. Brent Bauer says there needs to be more research on CBD. Early indicators show it's safe, but many questions remain. If it's strong enough to help you, it's strong enough to hurt you. Dr. Bauer tells his patients to do their homework and be sure to talk with their health care provider. I'm very optimistic that there will be something beneficial there. I don't think it's going to be magic. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Jason Howland. Terrific. And we'll start with Bob here. Bob, you did a poll, um, I believe, in October. We did a poll. <laughs> in conjunction with Politico <laughs> and Harvard T.H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. Um, walk us through some of the interesting and surprising findings from um, asking folks about uh, CBD and recreational marijuana. Uh, so quickly, how did we get here for this session? Because there's actually been very broad changes in the beliefs and values uh, of the average general public around uh, marijuana and its legalization for recreational purposes and uh, how CBD is seen. And you can see CBD as something, it's a pharmaceutical project at the FDA, or you could see it like dietary supplements, which the FDA itself takes treatment for every week because it's relatively unregulated uh, for that. So uh, we asked just simple uh, questions and what you're gonna see is the change and then some of the results are really gonna have uh, people taken back a second. So let's just look, the first slide is we asked people today uh, uh, on a harmfulness scale, what is harmful to people to use it? So to no surprise, tobacco cigarettes are at the top. Uh, but for a number of people who've been emailing me every single minute, you wouldn't think that electronic cigarettes were the second biggest threat. Uh, and would you uh, absolutely think about since we filled jails in America for years for people selling marijuana for recreational purposes that it's seen as less harmful than alcohol. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide. Uh, it's always been like this? No. There's been an incredible uh, cultural change. And uh, politics is my field and let me tell you what that number says. If I put it on a referendum it's going to win. Uh, that's simply what it says. Uh, for that, and if the state next to me got it by a referendum, there are going to be people in my state who are going to try to get the legislature to do it. So this is quite a profound, we're talking about 20 years here from, uh, of course that, and the federal law hasn't changed and people are just drifting themselves along. Next slide. Uh, so uh, we were able to separate out people who reported that marijuana was legal in their state for recreational purposes and asked them a very complex question. You need notes for this. <laughs> Is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> and it turns out that most people living in a state that did this, regardless of all the stories about driving and this and that and everything else, uh, think that the legalization a a a actually worked out. So that sort of sets the tone for a, a uh, debate that's going on and an oddity where this is highly illegal at the federal level and the culture is changing through the state level. So let me just switch quickly to CBD and quickly for anybody watching, one half of Americans doesn't know what the three words, three letters mean. So uh, let's agree to that. However, uh, those that do have uh, somewhat strong feelings. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, what we have is the uh, people familiar with the term uh, and uh, people who actually use it, which is a small subshare of the population. And so uh, uh, essentially the first question is, should the FDA regulate CBD for safety before it's put out there, like other pharmaceutical projects? And you could see it's among the people familiar just over half. However, if I'm a, a user of this product today, the answer is no. Keep the FDA out. And for the record, it's pretty close to what you find for dietary supplements today. So on our panels, everybody wants to regulate dietary supplements. For the person in the Topeka Turnpike, they have a different answer uh, 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 for that. Uh, and so um, uh, should they be able to buy it if it's not safe? Uh, for the general person, no. Uh, for the person who actually is a user for a public health school is sort of striking. You've just told them it's not safe and they say, I still should be able to buy it if I want to use it. 
uh, uh, for that. So the next has to do with effectiveness. And so uh, just so we have a balance here, schools of public health generally believe that things should only be uh, available if they're effective. That's our bias uh, for this. Uh, so uh, right out of the box, uh, uh, should it be available, uh, even if it's shown not to be effective, the bottom line is yes. Yes by the public in general, yes overwhelmingly by, uh, uh, by people who, who use it. And this is exactly the same findings that were reported 15 years ago in dietary supplements. When people said we don't know what's in them, these are risky and everything else, there was some support for safety. Uh, uh, to take things off the market that really threaten people's health. But there was, let me judge myself whether or not this works. And this is totally different than the other side. I called a pharmaceutical product, and we do not put it out there unless the clinical trials are very powerful. So this is the environment. None of this, we have no national referendum. None of this is requires something nationally, but it does change the culture of what goes on here. Terrific. Thank you, Bob. Stacy, you've been studying um, the long-term effects of, mar of marijuana, particularly on the brain and cognition, for a long time. Um, what does that research tell us, and, and, and where is there still more work to be done in this area? So I think, I think it's a great question, and it's important to remember that despite the proliferation of things like CBD-based products, et cetera, um, nearly all of what we know about the impact of marijuana comes from studies of recreational consumers, despite the fact that legalized medical cannabis has been around since 1996 in this, in this country. And what studies of recreational cannabis consumers or, or marijuana consumers typically show us is that these folks um, have alterations and things like cognitive performance, measures of brain structure and function. Um, earlier onset of marijuana use is typically associated with more pronounced alterations, um, likely due to the fact that the brain is particularly vulnerable during adolescence, not just to marijuana, but to lots of things, alcohol, illness, injury. Another concern is rising potency of marijuana products. We all know that products have changed over the last two decades. THC, the primary intoxicating constituent of the plant, um, has gone up uh, precipitously in these products in terms of uh, sort of the potency, if you will. And novel concentrate products, things like dabs, shatter, wax, we've all heard these terms, start life at about 35% THC and go north of 90% THC, raising concern from, for some of our more vulnerable uh, consumers like our, our adolescents. But it's important to remember that marijuana use is not the same when you're talking about recreational or medical patients. It's just not the same. The goal of use is wholly different. So our recreational consumers versus our medical patients, recreational consumers are using to change their current state of being, to get high. Our medical patients, on the other hand, are looking to alleviate symptoms. Because of this difference, the products that they choose are often very different. Our recreational consumers are looking for products high in THC. That's why we have these concentrate products across the marketplace. Our medical patients are often looking for products with THC um, in them, but they're often choosing products high in cannabidiol. And for the 50% who don't know what the, the three letters mean, cannabidiol is a primary non-intoxicating constituent of the plant. There are hundreds of other compounds and terpenes and, and flavonoids and other things. But it's important to remember the differences between these two groups. It's, it's also important to remember that we need more data regarding the impact of sort of the benefit and the risks associated with medical marijuana use, despite the fact that we've had legalization since 96, we have no longitudinal data. I started something called the MIND program in 2014 to help address some of those gaps in the literature. And what I can tell you is data from our first longitudinal studies of medical marijuana patients are in stark contrast to what we've seen in the recreational consumers, specifically relative to a baseline where they don't have any, quote, marijuana or cannabis on board. After 3, 6, 12, 18, and now 24 months, what we're seeing are improvements on measures of cognitive performance. Um, we're seeing improvements in clinical state, normalization of brain uh, structure and function, and interestingly, um, a rather precipitous reduction in the use of conventional medications, specifically opioids, critically important. Um, but it, in addition to these longitudinal observational studies, of which we have many, we are also conducting the very first clinical trials um, of plant-derived high CBD, very low, but not no, THC uh, sublingual solutions. We started with anxiety as our first indication. These studies are underway and actually may provide some of the data that we so desperately need. Um, they're, they're open label to double blind, which basically means open label, everybody gets the drug, double blind, some people get the drug, some people get placebo. This is the way we will be able to determine if in fact there's anything to it. But these 
studies are not so easy to begin. Current regulations actually limit our ability to study actual products that patients and consumers are taking. I can't do those studies, contrary to popular belief. Uh, we're still rather limited, and we do need investigations to clarify the impact of things like product source. We talked about hemp for a second. What's the difference between things that are hemp-derived versus cannabis sativa-derived? Are there differences? What about extraction methods? How do those things change? What about the entourage effect, the synergistic action of cannabinoids, terpenoids, flavonoids, all the things inherent in the plant that may actually yield a more efficacious um, benefit than uh, single extracted compound based products or an isolated CBD based product at significantly lower doses. Sort of the full spectrum versus single compound uh, question. It's important also just to remember that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to marijuana. It's not all good or all bad for any person and we need continued research on medical and recreational cannabis use in order to maximize therapeutic potential and mitigate risk and harm. Excellent. Thank you, Stacy. Um, David, CBD. What do we know about the medical uses of CBD and what are some of the studies that are out there right now and what don't we know? Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to join you guys. And even, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I think it's with respect to, to CBD, it's actually important to uh, recognize that the United States Food and Drug Administration, which is the uh, regulatory agency that is dedicated to assuring that our medicines meet quality and safety standards and have a demonstrated medical benefit, they actually uh, just approved the first CBD-based medication uh, for severe and rare forms of epilepsy. And that was based really on a parental report of CBD-rich helping their kids with epilepsy. So uh, the Center of Medic for Medicinal Cannabis Research has actually been around for 20 years. Actually, it started in California after California became the first state to legalize medical marijuana. And the state wanted to actually look to see if there was any real benefit of cannabis or marijuana for the conditions people were using it. And we looked to patients at first to see, well, how are they using it? How can we then apply some rigorous scientific um, methods to seeing if what they're doing actually makes medical sense? And so we had some of the first clinical trials of cannabis uh, uh, for pain and for spasticity and multiple sclerosis. Uh, we uh, used uh, placebo to assure that, you know, the findings that we had uh, were, uh, uh, were related to something in to, um, cannabis, uh, cannabis in this case with THC. There's different concentrations of THC. And there were like really three like take home messages from the first eight studies that we did. First off, um, in all the studies, cannabis actually uh, sh showed to be effective, uh, reduced pain and reduced spasticity in multiple forms. And the side effect profile was actually very consistent with some of the other medications that we're traditionally using for these conditions. Um, the third thing is, and this actually was only uh, there were two studies, the lower the, uh, lower the THC concentration, uh, we found that it, uh, the cannabis was still very helpful for, in this case, pain. Uh, but didn't have a lot of the uh, the intoxicating side effects that we sometimes worry about when we're thinking applying cannabis as a as a medicine. That's very different than CBD, um, which doesn't have the intoxicating. Um, but uh, in all, um, we are really still trying to figure out uh, how all the various ways in which CBD and THC can be helpful. Um, so, patient accounts for that. We're also uh, looking at some of the, the ways that we know CBD and THC interact with different parts of the body, uh, receptors in the body or cell types, uh, and how that might actually relate to different conditions uh, that, we, uh, that, we're, that we're treating. So we have CBD trials underway. Uh, they're looking at low, uh, CBD uh, for low back pain, um, for tremor, and for... Uh, for neuropathic pain. We have seven funded studies that we're trying to uh, get off the ground as well. And they look at a number of other different conditions like psychiatric conditions, like anxiety, psychosis, eating disorder, um, and sleep, um, neurological conditions like migraine um, and pain, neurodevelopmental conditions like uh, problems in autism, and then inflammatory conditions like arthritis. Um, CBD is a fascinating molecule. It has uh, a lot of different uh, potential activity out there. And so there's a lot of hype around what 
it might do, uh, some of that, you know, may turn out to be uh, very real. And it's the things, those are the things that we're trying to pursue to make sure that CBD is, uh, you know, really does find a place in our armamentarium of medical therapeutics. Um, so we need the controlled studies for CBD. We need to try CBD, as Dr. Gruber was saying, with other um, uh, you know, derivatives of cannabis as well to see if it's a combination of things that works best. We also want to uh, look at the um, different ways of administering it. So in, is it inhalation better than um, taking it orally? Or, or, I mean, heck, there are people even trying suppositories out there. So what, at the end of the day, I'm a physician, and I want to kind of make sure CBD fits within the whole kind of treatment uh, uh, Folio that we have for conditions. So it's one of the things that we could do to actually um, uh, to 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 treat a, a patient and alleviate uh, suffering or or um, you know cure, cure illness. Uh, CBD is not unsafe, but it's not without risks. Uh, so we need to have it has to be placed into context. To make sure that the risks and benefits are 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 appropriate for the condition. And the CMCR is really uh, looking at all, uh, is really focusing on clinical trials, but then also trying to uh, put things in a broader perspective. The liberalization of cannabis use legislation is a global phenomena. Um, I personally have talked about cannabis in Ukraine, Canada, Mexico. Uh, we've been discussing this with people in Asia as well. Um, there is an epidemiological uh, issues that we need to kind of focus on. We need to look at some of the potential uh, impact of cannabis on driving, those things that we are also doing. And we want to look at some of the mechanisms as well. So science can have these cannabinoids. And so, um, you know, all this hopefully will help us inform the public, doctors and patients, and uh, really kind of improve uh, our, our way of doing medicine. Thanks, David. And finally, we'll go to uh, Andrew. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the policy landscape. We've got this situation where we have this incredible disconnect between state law and federal law, where uh, you know marijuana is illegal under federal law, and yet we have you know 33 states that have some form of legalization. I guess what, how is the policy situation serving patients and consumers, and what could be done to to improve that situation? Yeah, so it's I think one of the most extraordinary political phenomenon of this generation, right? That where we are with cannabis is certainly the most striking form of direct democracy and political populism that uh, we've seen in American democracy in the, in the modern age. And so part of what I do is, for a living is essentially figure out how to undo some of the complications of that such that mm -hmm. public health can actually be the framework with which we look at, at cannabis. Um, I think the problem came in from the fact that, uh, as uh, David pointed out, public sentiment has been shifting for a long time on cannabis and the federal government has not. And there was a buildup of political support uh, that essentially just bubbled over into state referendums, uh, which um, essentially just asked us to defy federal government. And it really was a rejection of institutions um, because even it, it was in the face of doctors, police, everybody telling them, please don't vote yes on, on legalization and overwhelming still populist support uh, in a time where things are actually, it's hard to get 50 plus one and it was getting 60, 65 percent uh, approval rating. Um, but there's some complications that come from that. I, I think it's both extraordinary and, and frankly heartening that there's that sort of uh, path forward still in American politics, but uh, it, it it has created a movement that is going to be really hard to now fit a public framework, a public health framework to, uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, at the state and local level, um, and probably overall on the federal level at the end, people are going to be, politicians are going to be unlikely to promote any policy that reduces access to patients, but even to recreational users at this point. Um, because it's been such a, a powerful grass tops campaign, uh, they're hearing directly from constituents that anything you do that then reduces the access that we currently have um, is uh, antithetical to our movement. And so we are gonna ask you not to do that. And, and frankly, when you go to these states, you see they have power over both the Democrats and the Republicans to, to really stop any legislation that might do that. Uh, 
And that comes at a time of heightened consumer confusion over what all of this can do and a time of heightened snake oil uh, in, the, in, the, uh, um, in, the, in the retail space uh, with essentially no enforcement of our traditional institutions because they've all been rejected uh, in, this, in this space. And so how to figure out how to both educate consumers up and get the correct institutions back in the game, uh, enforcing a regulatory system that uh, ensures not just efficacy but also safety of the products is going to be an extremely difficult challenge uh, in this policy space, uh, but one that ultimately probably will fall on public health specialists. Um, for the most part, uh, looking at federal law going forward and even state law going forward, I, there has to be an acceptance, I think, on, on some level that most of this stuff is now innocent until proven guilty. Um, uh, claims are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, specific forms of the product are innocent until proven guilty, which again, it runs against most of the way we've seen consumer protection uh, in this world, where most of the time we're, we, we're highly skeptical of a new product. It has to pass a lot of rigor uh, before we allow it to go to consumers. That simply is not going to be the way with cannabis. Uh, and so how do we get back to a place where policy is led by science in this place? Uh, and, and the answer is it, we're going to have to become really creative here, both at the public health level and at the policy level. Terrific. Um, as you mentioned, there is a lot of enthusiasm around recreational marijuana. I mentioned Michigan had its first sales on Sunday. I think there were three dispensaries initially that opened in Ann Arbor, and you had people lined up around the block, and I think we've seen that repeated um, in state after state um, when they've allowed sales. And we're gonna take a look at a clip here of the first legal sale at the New England Treatment Access Dispensary in uh, Northampton. And you'll see that the, uh, the mayor here was the uh, first in line to uh, show his support for uh, this, this uh, new uh, realm of commerce. So let's take a look. Obviously historic that Northampton's playing an important role in making history in terms of the adult legalization of uh, cannabis. And uh, I'm, I'm proud to have been the first person to make the purchase. I think it sends a symbolic message that an elected official um, you know, is giving uh, credibility to this industry that for years has been, you know, the marijuana, cannabis has been stigmatized. Um, and so now we're bringing it out of the shadows. We're making it legal, regulated, safe, um, and available for adults to be able to purchase and consume responsibly. Well, I think that shows well some of the enthusiasm there. Um, what about, Bob, you, you mentioned the polling data. I think the, the poll that, that you conducted showed 62% support for legalization nationwide. I think a lot of other polling data has shown similar results. And yet, we haven't really seen any action by, by Congress um, to address this disconnect between state and, and federal law. I guess, how do, what do you think about that um, the, the kind of lack of action by Congress there, given where public perception is? Uh, it, so it turns out this is not the only issue. Uh, <laughs> guess, guess what? People want pharmaceutical prices regulated. It's the 70% level. No bill has come out. So there is a paralysis in institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, that has struck the American public and it's going to have electoral implications. People just can't figure for it. Uh, also, there's something called unwarranted medical bill, uh, billing. There's nobody in the Turnpike who says, I want an unwarranted medical bill. Congress has done nothing. They cannot come together on Monday and by Wednesday. Uh, I've done this. So we're going to have a situation where you're just going to have states one after the other. And then legislators are going to have a problem when the adjoining state has it and everybody's driving uh, in the Massachusetts and you're in New Hampshire. But we have a paralysis and it's affecting the public views about how government functions because the Congress can't take things that are 75% and pass anything. So we have a real institutional problem 
uh, 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 for this. Uh, and it's not a voting issue where you're voting everybody out, but it's an issue where people have just paralyzed the process. You need X number of votes to get out of a committee and they can't deliver. But this is a broader problem for this country that the elected representatives can't take a popular issue and move on it. And this is just one of them. Yeah, I mean, it's inter we had a, a vote on banking legislation yes. in September. Basically, this legislation would say banks can do business with cannabis companies without fear of, of federal punishment. And it passed 321 to 103, overwhelming support, almost half of Republicans backing it. But, you know, we haven't seen any action in the Senate, so yeah. it's kind of meaningless at this point. Andrew, what about from a, the regulatory landscape, um, how does the continuing federal prohibition affect the ability to have substantive, meaningful regulations to protect the public and to provide consumers what they're looking for? Well, uh, I think states are having to grow new muscles that they haven't had before. Um, uh, testing labs is a good example of that. Uh, never before have states been asked to do so much quality control. Uh, and I think doing an okay job at it. Actually, I, I think it's probably part of the weaker systems in, in every state. Um, but uh, pesticides, testing, uh, banking, there's a whole bunch of things that really the federal government has been always in charge of that the states are having a really difficult time uh, getting their hands around and figuring out. So it's really round pegs, square holes, um, and uh, a lot of really silly ways of getting things done. Um, but I think for a lot of people, and as polling shows, uh, they still prefer it over the status quo of, of prohibition. I think quickly to Bob's point about why we're not seeing any federal action, I, I think you, it's absolutely, this is a much bigger institutional issue. Um, but also to your, to your initial point, there's a difference between support versus it, voter salience. This is not one of their top 10 issues, no matter how you put it. Um, and then you mix on top of that, this takes all the oxygen in the room when you go for it. Uh, for some reason, and you see this in Canada, uh, even though it's nobody's top issue, it certainly gets to the top of the papers every time. And so when we do this, we're going to have to have a national conversation. When that national conversation fits into a whole bunch of problems that we're having right now, I have no idea. Okay. Um, I want to bring Dr. Grilotti in here. Um, I think you might have used the term uh, snake oil, or somebody did anyway. Um, but we have, you know, patients are using these products, whether it's CBD or marijuana, millions of people um, are using these products. But I don't think there's been a lot of uh, physician education in terms of helping doctors um, help their patients figure out how to use these products. I guess what are, the, what are the challenges there, and maybe Dr. Gruber, you can jump in on this too, but what are some of the challenges there and, how, and what do we need to do to address that? Well, so uh, you're right. There's a parallel health system out there. It's occurring at the level of the dispensary. People are going and uh, they're getting information about treating conditions from uh, what are you know called bud tenders, and uh, and, and many people when when I and, and they've actually done research, and people who are bud tenders do not actually understand the uh, cannabis science and in, in, in guiding their uh, recommendations for cannabis to to patients. Um, I think uh, from our end, you know, uh, when I'm in the community talking with patients, a lot of people are coming up to me and they say, you know, we want to go to UC San Diego and talk to a doctor about cannabis and get some recommendations cannabis from physicians. Um, we need to do a better job educating physicians. It's not really currently part of medical school curriculum. People uh, often are, uh, physicians are often learning about cannabis through uh, continuing med medical education courses that will feature cannabis. Uh, that is a good start. Uh, we've been working with uh, our medical board of California and the, there's a federation of medical boards that give, give uh, uh, clinicians guidelines about, you know, how can they approach recommending cannabis to patients when it's appropriate. We obviously need to improve the science. Uh, we, we need to give uh, physicians greater tools. These tools include like medicines they may actually be able to prescribe, uh, but also education about what the science tells us, what it doesn't tell us, how we can inform patients about what's involved in cannabis and cannabinoid-based medicines. Okay, terrific. Um, Stacy, what about, um, you mentioned the high THC uh, products that are out there, um, sometimes upwards of, you know, 30% THC. Um, 
and that the potency is, is rising mm -hmm. um, across the country. What, what, what challenges are there in researching the products that people are actually using in the marketplace and understanding what the uh, potential health ramifications of those are there? It's a great question. And because of our current guidelines and our current regulatory status, we don't have access to assessing the impact of these high concentrated, highly concentrated products, for example. Whether you're a recreational consumer or a medical patient, it doesn't matter. We can't study those. And typically, if you're going to do a study, a clinical trial with human subjects, you have two choices. You can have your products sourced by the National Institutes on drug abuse, and they have expanded their drug supply program exponentially in the last almost a decade. Um, but there are limitations to those products. They primarily exist in only flour-based product. They have two extracts. And there's no such thing as shatter, wax, dabs, nothing like that. There's no turnkey uh, sublingual solutions that are available. So products that patients typically avail themselves of, we wouldn't have access to in a turnkey fashion through NIDA. Now that hemp is um, outside of the Controlled Substance Act, that gives us a little bit more latitude. But understanding the impact of high potency products, whether it's in our more vulnerable consumers, our, our adolescents and kids for recreational purposes, or even our medical patients. Most of our medical patients try to concentrate once and say, yep, not for me. Um, too much, way too much. Uh, so it's important to be able to give them actual information. And you know, as, as Dave was mentioning, there's so little that most practitioners actually know these days. Most patients come in um, far, far more informed than any healthcare provider, and it's really, really important to change that narrative. Everybody needs to be on the same page. It's our, our job to actually give them the best information they can have to guide their own treatment, and so we can actually help make you know, these things slightly less harmful where we can. High potency products um, in our more vulnerable folks whose brains are, quote, still under construction, may very well yield a very, very different effect than those who are over the age of 60, 70. We're not so vulnerable um, at that time. Actually, we're going on the other side, right? Our brain is no longer developing. We're going the other way. So we need to be mindful of both sides. Well, it, it's you know the fastest growing consumer group of cannabis and cannabinoid-based products are those over the age of 50. By definition, now are older adults. So we actually have to, I know we actually have to be very mindful of this because as we age, right, we have reduced metabolism. We have interactions with the cytochrome P450 system in the liver, um, involving all sorts of other issues. Since as we get older, we tend to take more medicine. So it's very very important that we have the ability to actually assess products folks are really taking. I think there have been some initiatives, um, but nothing's actually come to fruition just yet. So. Okay. And what about CBD? Um, do we know, I mean, are there concerns about the level, the dosing levels that people are taking Absolutely. and our lack of knowledge about what's in these products? I mean, I think Dave mentioned, you know, when we think about Epidiolex, which sits on its own in Schedule 5, right? Schedule 5. It's a single extracted um, CBD-based product, which means it's 99.3% pure. There's no terpenoids or other cannabinoids featured in that product. Um, when we talk about single extracted compounds and the doses that individuals are yielding, quote, benefit from, for example, pediatric onset intractable seizure disorders, the range of uh, the dose is actually significantly higher than what we call full spectrum, you know, sort of... Um, plant-derived full-spectrum products where you have other cannabinoids, terpenoids, the essential oils that give cannabis its scent and a flavor profile, but also have their own biobehavioral effects. The dose ranges for efficacy apparently are significantly lower. Do we have a ton of empirically sound data on that? No. Do we need it? Absolutely. And that's probably going to differ from non-plant-derived products, these sort of synthetic CBD-based products. So you have a huge range. People will buy a product that's one ounce, and it has 10 to 15 or 20 milligrams of CBD, but it's full spectrum. That may be just as efficacious or more than something that's 150 or 200, quote, CBD isolate. So we need these studies. Okay. I want to pivot a little bit to um, vaping and the sort of public health crisis that we've been seeing around that and some of the questions about what's actually causing these, these lung illnesses. Um, we've had, I, I think the most recent numbers are somewhere around 2,300 confirmed lung illnesses and, and 47 deaths, I think I'm getting that right, that the CDC has confirmed. They've tied it to vitamin E acetate as a, as a culprit, but the CDC has also said there could be other other compounds in, in here that are, are causing illnesses as well. I guess I, w I wonder about public perception, uh, Bob. How does, do you think that has the um, potential to affect what, what, what you're seeing in this data in terms of people being um, supportive of, of marijuana legalization? And so uh, this is absolutely critical here. 
the public is much more interested in a safety violation than it is in efficaciousness here. So uh, just since July, uh, the very harmfulness of vaping uh, and my problem of being in public health, uh, it's not clear to me that vaping for my colleagues is that much worse than legalized marijuana for recreational purposes, but it's now 40 points difference. Uh, the minute people heard about the cases, uh, they wanted action on safety. They were not asking questions about whether or not smokers give it up or whatever it is. Uh, safety really plays out. So when there is a safety concern, there is dramatically more support for public intervention. It has no impact on the legalization of marijuana because uh, un until we can just share this, to the people I survey, THC is a misspelling of a duh. Uh, they have no idea. It had a little THC. They do understand vitamin E. I mean, they, yeah, they have no idea what the combination is. But the important point to take away is when something is unsafe, there's support for government intervention. We'll get back to this later. And that gets uh, a a activity. And so the ability to respond when there's an outbreak and set parameters around that, there is a real, both state health departments and the FDA uh, ha have, a, have a real opening. Uh, nobody is dragging Governor Baker through the streets for some pretty tough uh, uh, stands uh, on, on vaping, but only occurred after there was a safety issue. If he did that three months before, they would not understand why he was uh, taking that action. So safety changes the public mood, but they want action on the safety, not on the generic issue, we'll have no vaping or no marijuana, but it's on that a particular incident, they want action. Okay, and Andrew, I think you know most of the evidence for the with vaping points to uh, THC vapes, Verona vapes, and particularly from the the black market or the illicit market. And yet, if you look at the policy discussion in Washington, it's whether we should ban flavored e-cigarettes. <laughs> um, I guess how does the federal prohibition on marijuana? Um, that exists, even though millions of people are, are using it, affect our ability to have an effective public policy response to this public health issue? Yeah, um, it is, I think we are probably wasting a crisis right now uh, in the, that, uh, I mean, all public health crises are unfortunate. We are, this is an extremely unfortunate crisis to have happened to vaping because uh, as far as I can tell, the, the best thing that we should be talking about is quality control and quality assurance. Mm -hmm. And that means ramping up a regulatory system. Uh, instead, it's become a divisive issue uh, about the nature of vaping and the nature of, of marijuana on the public policy debate side. Even though, uh, again, I agree with Bob, that is not how it's being viewed on the, on the population side. There's a lot of uh, people who've been waiting for a vaping crisis in order to have a few vaping debates. And so those are the debates they're deciding to have kind of regardless of what the actual good public policy would be going forward. Uh, I wish that we were at a place where we said, great, this is just proof that we need quality assurance, we need quality control, uh, and then we need to separately address the issue of um, is vaping overall a benefit to public health or is it uh, an actual crisis that leads to more tobacco use down the road or, or whatever the, the, the much bigger picture of what vaping does to society, but we've just completely confused them. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, um, the, the disconnect there. What about the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration has really been actively wrestling with what to do about this proliferation of, of CD, CBD products. And you've seen them take some action um, around particularly companies that have made medical claims that aren't backed up by, by evidence. Um, just last week, I think I mentioned before, they sent out 15 warning letters to, uh, to companies. And they also sort of reiterated that they don't think um, CBD is a, is a harmless substance. I guess I want to start with the, the, per, the uh, public perception here. So I'll go to you, Bob. Like, is there an appetite for FDA to take aggressive action to regulate this burgeoning space? Uh, so again, I always have to ap apologize because the answer doesn't fit a school of public health. There's a public interest uh, in not efficacy but in safety. Mm -hmm. And this is really important. And it's the exact reversal of what we do with prescription drugs. We don't care if it's safe and they don't work. 
uh, uh, here, uh, there is a real role for the FDA uh, to be able uh, to intervene post-market, is what they like to call it, if anything shows up and pull it off the market. Secondly, to be testing various things about whether or not they're dangerous. But you get into a public problem if you say mom and dad think they think better as a result of this and the FDA couldn't show it so you can't have it. That's different that uh, mom and dad went in a coma. Uh, and you, you pull it off uh, off the market. So there's a real opening recall. Most Americans half don't know what it is, most aren't using it. For them to really have a floor in, in, in the safety issue, including pulling things off very quickly, uh, which oddly they have in food. Uh, so uh, if, if your lettuce is in trouble, they can pull it off. Right. Uh, if your CBD is in trouble, no. Uh, it's sitting there. So it, to me, it's the safety that they, which is reverse of what we normally do. They really want to have it and the ability to move very quickly to protect people and they will find that. There is public support for not allowing people to go on television and say that your cancer will be cured with one of these. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, keep that off the air if you can't prove it. But the safety is, is really where you have to be and we tend to do it in reverse. If it's efficacious, we then later find out it may not be safe. But the ability to respond quickly, uh, and just one other point we'll get back to is, and it's the problem with uh, politics versus public health. Uh, uh, public health has a lot of very legitimate concerns about dietary supplements. But in my world of politics, they lost that battle. Uh, this, you are not taking dietary supplements off those calendars. And so I'm afraid with CBD, if you don't have at least the footwork on safety, you could be in a situation where we can't take action uh, because it is so part of people's lives. But now there is with CBD, very few people are using it. it. It's just something that's out there. You could set up a safety framework and it would be acceptable. I wanna drill down on the safety issue a little bit. Uh, maybe David, if you could jump in. Um, I mean, how, what concerns are there about CBD and safety and how concerned should we be about it given that everybody, um, everybody is taking it? <laughs> That's a good question. I th you know, it's interesting. Uh, it's still murky for researchers about what approach we can take to actually study this because the law is in flux. And we're trying to keep up with uh, the with Whole Foods and other marketplaces that are selling it on their shelves. I think the vaping associated lung injury that we were talking about is a good example of this. When those reports were coming out, um, researchers like ourselves uh, who work at uh, institutions that receive federal funding uh, may have put all that federal funding in jeopardy if we actually had to study these what were illegal products. Uh, so we felt somewhat handcuffed in our ability to actually respond to the vaping uh, crisis, uh, even though kids were dying. And unfortunately, the government and the CDC actually uh, did a lot of the work to get that to, to identify vitamin E acetate, at least one of the problems associated with those vaping injuries. But in general, you know, CBD does have some safety um, concerns. Uh, for one thing, it can irritate your liver. We don't really understand that. It may have to do with other uh, medications that you are taking at the time, um, but then something that when you're going, if you were in, in our clinical trials, for example, we monitor, we monitor your liver function tests. Um, now, the people in the community may be doing, using very low doses of CBD and things that may not irritate your liver. And so the concerns may be very, um, very much less. Uh, but as Stacy was saying, we really don't have a lot of information about what C how C if, if CBD is helpful in these very low doses that seem to be more uh, uh, common in the community. One thing that we do know is that CBD, regardless of where you get it, costs a lot of money. So we need to uh, do this work because just to save people from, you know, uh, making choices about their money that may actually not really benefit them at all. What about? You want to jump in, Andrew? I would just point out that I think one of the things that's missing the most in here uh, is that FDA actually has no path forward for CBD to be legal in any way. And so 
Uh, one of the most effective mechanisms for uh, enforcement is just that the industry wants to remain on the right side of the law. But what we've essentially just said is there's no way to remain on the right side of the law. So you have places like Cureleaf that says, well, let's just make outrageous statements yes. still because we're already illegal, so we can be extra illegal. And so uh, even though the efficacy part of the debate is not what's important to the, the populace, um, it, it is very important that FDA figures out how to set guidelines for CBD as soon as possible. Because once they do, industry will follow that. Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be a big um, divide in industry from what I've seen in terms of how aggressive they want FDA to be to police this industry. And you're seeing a lot of companies that are that are begging FDA to, to take action because they're concerned that, you know, some of the bad players in this space are going to, you know, cause reputational harm to everyone, to folks that are doing things right, that are testing, that are using, you know, legitimate products. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where they, they, they finally come down here. I think we mentioned earlier that the, one of the fastest growing areas of use is among older adults. Um, whether we're talking about CBD or marijuana. Are there particular concerns, Dr. Gruber, that we should have about people who are 65 plus um, who are using these products? Sure, and again, it's the fastest growing group you know, in the country. And I think, unfortunately, as we age, biology is cruel, right? We don't typically get better with regard <laughs> to cognitive performance. So the question is, you know, will cannabis or, or marijuana-based products or cannabinoid-based products um, impact that even more negatively, right? So do people get worse, which is why we have these longitudinal studies where we look at folks taking real world products and actually it looks like they get better because perhaps their symptoms are alleviated. Perhaps it's because they're beyond the period of neurodevelopmental vulnerability. There's some preclinical data suggesting that a little bit of exogenous or outside cannabinoid exposure to the aging endocannabinoid system, the system we all have inherent to each of us, actually results in a benefit. Uh, but in terms of the risks, we have reduced metabolism, so it takes longer for us to clear things. Um, this is especially important when we think of modes of use, not just smoking or vaping or sublingual uh, solutions or thankfully suppositories, uh, but um, <laughs> things like edibles, which are incredibly popular in our older population, right? They take a little bit, they take a little more, and the rise time or the time to get an effect is significantly longer than you might expect as we get older. Um, and the duration of effect is significantly longer. That could be a problem. So duration of effect, uh, you know, time to clear it. And of course, then we have the involvement with the liver, the cytochrome P450 system. Unfortunately, whether it's THC or CBD, both impact um, these, these enzymes. So we have to be mindful about inadvertently increasing or decreasing the efficacy of other things, quote, on board. So these are all things to keep in mind. Doesn't mean they can't use it, but it means we really have to be mindful about the ways in which people are using it. And mode of use, as well as product choice, is going to be very, very important here. Okay. And I should say, um, that was a question that was sent in by uh, Lisa and I'm going to try one more here before we need to, to wrap up. And we have a question here from Judy. And it says, can you address the concerns about marijuana being a, a gateway drug? And I'll tee this up a little bit in that, um, you know, Joe Biden recently uh, used, used this phrase in, in talking about marijuana and got a lot of blowback. And I think eventually sort of walked that back. Um, but that's been you know, a perception and a, a talking point in, in federal drug policy for decades. Um, and I'll throw this, I'm not sure who to toss this to, so, but uh, may, maybe Dr. Gruber, it sounds like. Um, should we be concerned that this is going to lead to, you know, other more problematic drug use? So I think it's a great question, and it's one that's been posed for many, many decades. As most people know, is marijuana, you know, a gateway to health or gateway to hell, right? This is what I typically <laughs> get. Which is it? Um, and I think the answer is, is becoming clearer for most people. Um, you know, when we think about the height of cannabis or marijuana use in this country, we didn't see exponentially in increased rates of other substance use. We just didn't. The fact that other um, drugs become um, more frequently used by individuals who, quote, start off using cannabis very often comes down to um, other factors, like the individual's you're spending time with, your social group, your peer group, all of those things make a difference. From a neurobiologic perspective, the reward circuitry in your brain responds to cannabis, to sugar, to all sorts of things. Um, so it's not as if uh, cannabis will necessarily change the ways in which those receptors respond and say, ah, oh, now I'm hungry for this, now I'm hungry for that. Um, it's a reinforcing system, and so you have to be mindful. But I don't think there's much evidence in terms of, quote, the gateway phenomenon in human subject studies at this point. Okay. Um, we got one more question coming in, and I think we can do it quickly, maybe. Um, and this is from uh, Dana. 
How does marijuana and CBD interact with mental health issues? Do we know if their use can amplify existing problems such as bipolar disorder? So we've actually done, and Dave may want to weigh in, we've actually done some studies of folks with, uh, our first studies were um, in patients with bipolar disorder who did and did not use cannabis or marijuana. It's the second most commonly used substance in patients with bipolar disorder. Why? Because some folks experience mood regulation. Um, I had patients say, you know, when I feel like I'm spinning out of control, I take two hits, I feel calm. Other folks said when I feel really down or depressed, I take a few hits, I feel better. We did um, an EMA study, so folks actually rated their mood before and after using cannabis throughout the day. And as it turns out, for at least a subset of folks using cannabis, they actually did experience a mood stabilization. Does that mean all patients with bipolar disorder should go out and just use any cannabis? <laughs> Probably not. Um, and one of the reasons that we started the MIND program was to try to figure out the ways in which we could harness therapeutic potential and mitigate risk by figuring out which constituents were more helpful. As it turns out, some of the folks that we deal with, with chronic anxiety or bipolar disorder, do very well on a combination, very low THC, high CBD. But whether that remains true over time, we'll see. Okay, we do have to wrap up here. I want to I want to send it to you, David, um, for kind of a final thought, either teeing off of that or, or anything else you'd like to kind of sum up here. Well, I, I, I'm a psychiatrist. I think when patients come in and they tell me that they're having a lot of problems and they're using a lot of uh, marijuana, I might say like, well, maybe that's not really helping. Um, and then for other conditions, we actually think there might be a benefit out there. We just don't know a lot. We're, you know, for 3,000 years, cannabis was uh, a medicine. It was used for a variety of different conditions. And it was really like 100 years ago that it was taken off, largely for reasons that uh, taken out of our pharmacopoeia for, for uh, medicine. And we're now putting it back in. It's for our dark ages, and we're kind of emerging into this renaissance. That for all the questions that we've uh, pondered today. Science is this candle in the dark. And we need to kind of really reinforce the science so we can have a better understanding of cannabis and its constituents so we can make the most educated decisions about how to use uh, them. We know that there is some benefit out there. We've, we've, we've demonstrated that already. And we just need to then put it in context uh, just like we would do any other uh, uh, medicine. And then, you know, the recreational side, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to others, but uh, it's also an important consideration that we have. Okay. Andrew, a final takeaway you want to leave us with today? Yeah. When I was uh, the director of marijuana coordination for the, the governor, one of the things I often had to say to our public health specialists is, for a while, some things need to just be good enough for government. Uh, good, just, uh, uh, I think... There's a paralysis that is going around around marijuana that until we know everything, we should govern nothing. Uh, and that's just not gonna work here. So I hope that the public health uh, specialists start to come through with frameworks, both for recreational and for medicinal, that we can use in the interim between when the science actually does catch up here. Stacy, final thoughts you want to leave us with? I, I couldn't echo these sentiments um, any more strongly. Go on <laughs> any more strongly. Um, it, it's like rock and roll, right? In the old days, it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Patients and, and consumers are using it, and to wait until we have all of the information is just not logical or feasible. And and our patients and our consumers deserve. They deserve this data. And so what we need to do is whatever we have to do to get the science to be in an empirically sound place where we say we know this, we don't know this, but along the way we have to make choices that make good sense. Okay, Bob, you get the final final word here. Uh, so on the CBD side, uh, there's a need that the FDI recognizes it exists. And then secondly, it has to deal with safety first. And it's not going to go away. When the Senate Majority Leader leads the bill through that has hemp, many of you may have thought he was interested in having rope <laughs> sold in the United States, but that really wasn't it. This isn't going back, but all across stores in the United States, signs are out there, CBD. It's not going back. And so the question is whether or not there's an established role that if it's dangerous, we can pull it off the market. And as long as the FDA doesn't recognize it exists, it's just going to grow. You're not going to seize the military in the CVS and take the counters off. I'm sorry. I lived through this with dietary supplements. You didn't show me Ginseng worked. Uh, you try to take it off the market. Uh, so we really need to have safety protection and then the efficacy stators. But the safety thing has to be there by the FDA. So if somebody gets hurt, we pull it off the market because that doesn't exist now. Okay, that's, that's terrific. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Um, thanks to our panelists. I do want to plug um, that we're going to have, that Harvard's going to be hosting uh, another of these events um, next 
Wednesday, I believe this is December 11th at noon. Should be very interesting. Curbing gun violence Another strategies. Well, <laughs> <laughs> strategies for change. So I hope everybody can uh, can tune in for that uh, next week. And uh, thanks for joining us today.